In the last section, I stumped myself in thinking about the normal force being conservative or not. I did a little bit of research on that subject, and it turns out it's a rather divisive issue in the world of physics, as it, uh, with not a, a whole lot of agreement. Um, as it turns out, it's not going to affect what we'll do in this class anyway. And um, what does matter is that the gravitational force is conservative. So I'll let that uh, be a subject for future investigation and discussion. Now finally, as promised, we're going to do the conservation of mechanical energy. Derive the conservation of energy from the work energy theorem, assuming that the work done by non-conservative forces is negligible. Find the total mechanical energy. All right. So we're going to do a derivation here, and I expect you to be able to work through this one. It's, a, it's an important one. It, it is based entirely on concepts we've already done. It's quite easy and straightforward. So the work done by the net force, we're going to consider only the work done by conservative forces. The only one that we've considered so far is gravity. So let's just put gravity in by itself. And we're assuming that the work done by non-conservative forces is negligible. Now this is a mouthful, um, but it's an important mouthful. We have to be able to assume that the work done by non-conservative forces is negligible. What about friction, uh, kinetic friction? That's certainly one that we have to worry about. Air drag. Um, if we can ignore the work done by those types of forces, then uh, energy is conserved. So we're ignoring here the work done by friction, for example, or the work done by drag. So we're considering these to be uh, negligible, meaning we can neglect them in the analysis. And so all we're left with is the work done by the net force is equal to the work done by gravity. Um, one instance of where you couldn't neglect friction would be the, the case of the block moving along the the tabletop that I did in the demo video. Well, that, that friction was doing a lot of work, and it's not going to be negligible in that case. All right. Now, what we'll do is invoke uh, concept C6-3, the work energy theorem, to set the work done by the net force equal to the change in the kinetic energy. That's the work energy theorem. And we're going to use the concept C6-4 that the work done by gravity is the negative of the change in the potential gravitational potential energy. So those two concepts get us pretty much the rest. Uh, the rest of this is just algebra. It's not that hard. Change in kinetic energy is the final minus the initial. No problem there. The change in the potential energy, this minus sign just comes along for the ride. The change in the potential energy is the final potential energy minus the initial potential energy. Now what we're going to do is to try and collect terms on the same side of the equation that refer to the final time. So here's this final kinetic energy. It just comes along for the ride. It stays on the left-hand side of the equation. Well, here's a term that involves the final potential energy. I want to get it on the left side of the equation. How do I do that? Well, it's here on the right side with a minus sign in front of it. So I can add the final potential energy to both sides of the equation. It'll cancel on the right side and appear on the left side. And here it is. Here's its appearance. Now, on the right side, I'd like to collect all the terms involving the initial time. Here's a term involving the initial time minus the initial kinetic energy. If I want it on the right side of the equation, I'm going to 
add it to both sides of the equation. It'll cancel on the left side and appear on the right side, right here. And then finally, we've got this term that is a negative, negative uh, potential, initial potential energy. Negative times a negative is positive. So here it is. So what we have here is a rather curious thing. I've got the final kinetic plus the final potential on the left, the final kinetic, the initial kinetic plus the initial potential on the right. So we define the total mechanical energy as the sum, you add up the kinetic plus the potential. Kinetic energy plus potential energy is called the total mechanical energy. With that definition, then the left side of this equation is the final kinetic plus final potential. That's just the final total mechanical energy. And on the right side, we have the initial kinetic plus initial potential. That's just the initial um, total mechanical energy. So what this says is pretty cool. <coughs> the final total mechanical energy equals <coughs> the initial total mechanical energy. It's pretty amazing. And this is very, very useful in problem solving. And I'll sh do a couple of examples. But first, uh, a couple of statements about this. The total mechanical energy, E equals kinetic plus potential, of an object remains constant as the object moves around through space, provided that the work done by non-conservative forces is negligible. So you have to be able to ignore those non-conservative forces. Then you'll get cons conservation of energy. Now this is the first example of a conservation principle that we'll talk about in this class. We will later talk about the conservation of momentum and the conservation of angular momentum. But when physicists say that an a quantity is conserved, what they mean is that it does not change. So conserved means that it does not change. And that's what we've said here. It remains constant. So if I say that energy is conserved, I mean it remains constant as the object moves through space. Um, and here's the kind of more, a little deeper philosophical statement of the conservation of energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be converted from one form to another. So we can convert kinetic to potential, or potential back to kinetic. And, but, but the energy, the total energy, the sum of the two has to remain the same. So if you increase the potential energy, you're going to have to decrease the kinetic energy, or vice versa. We'll see um, this in various guises during this semester when we talk about springs and also next semester when we talk about electric potential energy, and also next semester when we talk about E equals mc squared, that energy and matter are, are different forms of the same quantity, and, and um, through Einstein's famous relationship. So here's an example. Uh, you've got a, a sled. Suppose it, uh, you consider it to be frictionless. Uh, that slides down this track. At the top, when it's at the top of the track, the height is large. And so the gravitational potential energy must also be large. So we're going to start off with a lot of gravitational potential energy. So maybe 600,000 joules when it's at this top position. Uh, the kinetic energy at the top is zero because we're releasing it from rest. So then it, it's, it goes down the track, um, 
in the middle here somewhere, it still has some gravitational potential energy, but it's less. It has less potential energy than it did before. So 400,000 instead of 600,000. But it's gained some kinetic energy, so that the sum of the two, 200,000 plus 400,000, is still 600,000. That's what we mean by a conserved quantity. It's constant. It doesn't change. And then now down here at the bottom, um, where h equals 0, mgh must also be 0. And the gravitational potential energy is 0. But now, if energy is conserved, then lo and behold, the, that, that energy is completely contained in kinetic energy. Let's do an example. An arrow is launched straight up from the surface of, an, of the Earth. So we actually have to have the arrow shoot straight up to be this example. Which one of the following statements describes the energy transformation of the arrow as it rises? Neglect air resistance. So as it's rising up, the kinetic energy of the arrow increases and its potential energy decreases. True or false? That's not true. Because as you get higher and higher, the potential energy increases, not the kinetic. The kinetic energy decreases because it's going to slow down. The speed is going to be less. The kinetic energy of the arrow decreases and the potential energy increases, and that's the one that we want. The total energy of the arrow increases. What about this one? The total mechanical energy, sometimes called the total energy, and other times just called the energy, increases. You say, well, no, that can't be. The energy would have to be conserved as long as uh, we're neglecting air resistance, which would be a non-conservative force. So. All right, a gymnast leaves a trampoline at an initial height of 1.2 meters and reaches a maximum height of 4.8 meters. So this is, the initial height is 1.2 meters and the final height is 4.8 meters. Before falling back down, what was the initial speed of the gymnast? Great question. This is an example of the power of um, conservation energy. Let's do it. The initial total mechanical energy equals the final total mechanical energy if non-conservative work done by non-conservative forces can be neglected. Can it be neglected in this case? Yeah, he's a big, heavy gymnast. Uh, air resist he's going to be moving fairly slowly through the air, so air resistance can be neglected in this case. Initial kinetic plus potential. Here's the initial kinetic. Uh, here's the initial potential energy. Final kinetic, final potential energy. Let's plug. Um, well, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to start canceling some things. We can simplify this equation by multiplying through left and right sides by 2. So I'm going to multiply this term by 2, this term by 2, this term by 2, and this term by 2. Well, that 2 cancels this 1 half. We'll have a 2 left over there. This 2 cancels that 1 half. And then I'm going to divide through the whole equation by the mass. So that mass, of mass, all these masses get killed. And what's left over is v naught squared plus 2gh naught. There's the 2 gh naught equals vf squared, the final speed squared, plus 2gh. Uh, 2gh final. We're looking for the initial speed of the gymnast. So it's an interesting thing. It's pretty easy to figure out. I mean, you can estimate. You could put a little ruler or tape measure, find out how high the gymnast went, and, and that's easy to measure, 4.8 meters. Um, but it's a little harder to measure the velocity. This is an example of, of a problem where you can actually calculate the velocity, the initial velocity. Well, 
to find v naught, that's what we're looking for, his initial speed here. His final speed is zero. But to find the initial speed, I'm going to have to solve this equation for v naught. How do I do that? How about if we subtract 2g h naught for both sides of the equation? It'll cancel on the left side, and we'll left, be left with this mass mess on the right side. Then we're going to take the square root of v naught squared to find v naught. And here we go. Here's my v naught, and I had to take the square root of this whole mass, uh, the square root of v f squared. That's that term. Two uh, g h f is this term. Two g h naught is that term. Where I've factored out the 2g. Well now we can just plug in the numbers. We know that the final speed is 0 meters per second and we know 2, we know g, um, gravitational acceleration, final minus initial heights. And you plug the numbers in and you get 8.5, roughly 8.5 meters per second. It's how fast he was going when he just left the trampoline mat. Another example, it's actually similar in a lot of ways, but it seems, it seems a lot more complicated. This one seems really bizarrely hard, but it's very easy with conservation of energy. A motorcyclist is trying to leap across a canyon. This is Evil Knievel, and by driving horizontally off a cliff at 38 meters per second. Ignoring air resistance, find the speed at which the cycle strikes the ground on the other side. As long as you don't need the time of flight, then conservation of energy is going to be your friend for solving problems. In this case, they're not asking how long he was in the air. All we're trying to find is his speed when his cycle strikes the ground on the other side. We're, the diagram shows that his initial height is 70 meters. His final height is 35 meters. And so we can now apply conservation of energy to try and solve the problem. Here's the initial total mechanical energy on the left side. And here's the final total mechanical energy on the right side. Kinetic plus potential. We multiply through by 2, divide by mass, same as we did in the previous one. Get this equation. Instead of solving for v naught now, we're going to solve for v final, because we have v naught. So we solve this equation for v final by subtracting 2ghf from both sides of the equation, giving this result, the algebra is similar to the last example, plug in the numbers, and that gives 46.2 meters per second. Now, for you to do this with uh, equation uh, with chapter three, with the equations of kinematics, would have taken you a long time. Um, and the reason is, you would have had to find the x component of final velocity, the y component of final velocity. You'd have had to find this final speed by um, the square root of the sum of the squares of the components of the speed of the components of the velocity, and it would have been a big amount of work. This is just essentially a step or two of algebra. As long as you can do this algebra, you, you'll be great. Uh, what about this one? A person starts from rest with the rope held in the horizontal position. So here's the rope. Swings downward and then lets go of the rope. Three forces act on him. His weight The tension in the rope and the force of air resistance. So there might be some drag here. Let's just call it with a D. Uh, can the principle of conservation of energy be used to calculate his final speed? The short answer is yes. Um, the tension is a non-conservative force. It was on the list of non-conservative forces. However, the tension does not work. Why? His displacement at any given point, let's look at this point here, his displacement is this way, 
the tension is that way. They are perpendicular to each other at all times. So the work done by tension can be neglected. It's negligible. What about the work done by air drag? Well, he's a heavy guy. Uh, he's not going very fast. I know these, an these arguments are a little bit hand wavy, but if you've got a person that's moving at normal speeds, not, not at, I mean, speeds that you can run or, or walk or swing on a swing, usually the air resistance can be neg neglected. As soon as you're getting up to sprinter speeds, um, with sprinters running, you know, 15 miles an hour or something like that, then, then air drag might be, become important. So this can be neglected. The work done by the air drag, the work done by tension, and we only have the work done by gravity, and that is conservative force. So we can actually uh, use this to calculate his final speed. And this one will be exactly the same. We do the algebra exactly the same as you did for this motorcycle. You um, have an initial speed here, and then you solve this equation to find his final speed. Here, it's even easier because the initial speed is zero. So um, you just use that same equation and plug in the numbers that you have. And you'll find, um, I guess you'll need, you need the radius of this, this rope. It's not given to us, but we can certainly, if you knew that, then you could uh, do the calculation. Or alternatively, if you knew H naught and H final, uh, which are definitely related to the difference between those gives the radius of the rope. Uh, the Kingda Ka roller coaster includes a vertical drop of 127 meters. That is a big drop. That's like a football field on its, on its end. Assuming a car speed of 6 meters per second at the top, so the car is going to be going 6 meters per second while it's going horizontally at the top. Find the speed at the bottom, neglecting friction, the friction of the track, the, ro the, the wheels on the track, and air resistance. Um, same equation that we derived a couple of examples ago. Here it is. Plug in the numbers, and you get 50.3 meters per second. That's assuming that friction and air resistance can be neglected. Actual measurements of this uh, roller coaster ride give a final speed of about 45 meters per second, which is 101 miles per hour. So I'd say we did pretty darn good. Even though the speeds are very, very high, um, we did pretty well by assuming conservation of energy. This is just one indication that normal speeds, I mean, normal, uh, we're not usually going this 100 miles an hour in our lifetime. We can usually neglect um, air drag as long as we're talking about human bodies and not feathers or ping pong balls or things like that.